Good morning, church, again, and happy Sabbath. This morning, before we get into our message, I would like to ask Eddie Michaels if he can find his way up to the front here. Eddie will be our speaker for our evangelistic meetings beginning tonight. Amen. 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 I'll, I'll support you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and Eddie this, Eddie this, Eddie this weekend uh, graduated here from our, our university in Southwestern. So congratulations, Eddie. I'd like to ask for the elders that are, are nearby, that are here, if they can join me up in the front. I'd like to have a word of prayer for Eddie as he not, not only has the meetings tonight and for the rest of these next two weeks, but as he continues with the plans that God has for him, that, that God may lead you wherever he wants you to go, but most of all, that you may be willing to go and do whatever he wants you to do. So i like us to have two prayers. I will have a prayer. Is there another elder who would like to have a prayer? Okay. No. All right. Let's just put our arms here around Michael and I'm on Eddie, I'm sorry, and, and let's pray. <clears throat> Go ahead, Tom. Loving Father, you know how many of us have come into this message because of evangelistic meetings. And you know it is not the speaker, but your Holy Spirit that drives it. And so we pray for our brother Eddie that you will fill him to overflowing with your spirit. And that you will cause people to come to these meetings and that you will open up their ears, give them spiritual discernment to hear words of truth that will draw them into a close relationship with your beloved Son and our Savior so that all can be on the sea of glass when the end of time comes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, I just continue in asking that you continue to bless Eddie. You know how he has walked with you, how he came into your word, came into your movement. And Lord, I just ask that you continue to bless him, not only in these meetings here, but wherever his plans are after the meetings, that you guide him, you give him strength and confidence that you are always with him just how you have been in the past. I ask that you bless the meetings, not just here in Cleburne, but everywhere they are being held at from the other, from the other students as well. That you bless your word and your message and the efforts at every city that these meetings are being held. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Congratulations, Eddie. God bless you. See you right there. Come here. This is for you. Oh, God bless. thank you. God bless you, okay? That's I need to stand on here to reach you. <laughs> <clears throat> and just a quick announcement. Those that are going to play the piano, that are pianists, or going to lead out in, in the theme song during the meetings, if we can just meet in the chapel right after church uh, for a couple of minutes right after church, those who are the pianists and choristers as well. <clears throat> Our scripture reading there was in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, if you open your Bibles there. And as you are going there, just a little review, we've been looking at the book of Daniel, and we have seen on how Daniel is, has, is a preparation for the last days. 
And I've tried to preach from the book of Daniel without going into the prophecies, because we will in, the, in these next two weeks beginning tonight, but even looking at the message in the prophecies. And we've seen that in Daniel 1, Daniel was a stranger in a strange land. And we too are strangers in a strange land. And God has called us to be different, to be strangers just like he did Daniel. We were reminded there in Daniel 2 and also repeated in Daniel 7 that God is in control. And he reminded Daniel when he was a young man in Daniel 2 and when he was an older man in Daniel 7 that God still has this world in his hands. And that Satan is not in control. He may look like it, he's winning at times. But at the end, the Lord wins and the Lord has his will be done. We saw there in Daniel chapter 3 that we do not create our own image. You remember Nebuchadnezzar made his own image of all gold. He didn't like the interpretation of Daniel, so he gave his own interpretation. And we need to be careful that as we come to the Word of God, we don't give our own interpretation. We'll, but we let God interpret the Word of God for us. The Bible is its own interpretation. And Daniel 4, you know, Daniel 4 still needs to be fulfilled in many of our people here. Daniel's 4 message was humble yourself or God will humble you. Humble yourself or God will humble you. We can sometimes push God to the limit and God pushes back. In Daniel 6, we've seen that there is a den that is waiting for us. There is a den that is waiting for us. In Daniel 8, we looked at God is in control of time. That God is in control of time. So there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, no, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse, verse 15. We are told to rightly divide the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And there also in 2 Timothy chapter 3 now, verse 1, this is why it's important to be rightly dividing the word of truth. But know this, that in the last days, earliest times will come. Hard times will come. Difficult, challenging times will come. So what, what does that mean? What kind of hard times? Well, the Bible tells us there what kind of hard times. It gives us a description of people that are unforgiving, unloving, people that love themselves too much, proud, blasphemers, and it keeps on giving the list of lists of what the hard times and also connected with the hard times that Jesus told us would happen in the last days. So what is the solution that Paul gives us to survive in the last days? How many of us here want to survive in the last days? All of us do, by the grace of God. And what is the solution that Paul tells us right there at the end of chapter 3, of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13? It says, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. He's still talking about the pearliest times, the de deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So here Paul is telling, is telling Timothy and reminding him, although there will be hard times, and evil men and imposters will come and grow worse and worse. You still continue in the things which you have learned. What things? It continues right there in, in verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the what? The holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, is good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. For every good work. How does Paul give the solution? During the hard times, during the apostasy, during the evil men, he says, hold on to the word of God. Hold on to the word of God, knowing the scriptures that are able to make you wise. And then he even spears headed in verse 16 by just reminding him, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is still good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. When people may say, well, we don't need doctrine, we just need Jesus. Paul here is saying, doctrine is still what you need. And actually, you can't separate the, the two. Jesus is doctrine. You find Jesus in every single doctrine. If you don't, you're missing. You're missing the whole message. You're missing the whole message. So here Paul is reminding us, the way to live through apostasy, through error, through confusion in the last days is to study the Word of God. To study the Word of God. And I've been emphasizing on studying the Bible. On studying the Bible, reading the Bible. And somebody asked me and uh, commented, you know, some people don't know how to do that. How do you study the Bible? Do you just read it and then you're done and you close it and I'll, okay, I had my Bible study. So today I want to share with you, I want to share with you some methods of how you can benefit the most from Bible study. From Bible study. And so I want to share there from Great Controversy, page 625. It's in the back of your bulletin. But here it says, Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusions that take the world captive. So who is going to be prepared? Only those who have diligently studied, who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusions that take the world captive. By the Bible's testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. Don't you want to be able to detect <laughs> Satan? To all the testing, to all, the testing time will come. Everybody. So how important is it that we all study? Even our children, to all, everyone. The testing time will come. By the sifting of temptations, the genuine Christian will be revealed. Are the people of God now so firmly established upon His Word that they will not yield to the evidence of their senses? Are we? Are we ready? Notice the question how it ends. Not yielded to the, ev to the evidence of their senses. The Bible is above our senses. The Bible is above our senses. Would they in such a crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible only? Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. To stand in that day. So if you're not having a Bible study, if you're not studying your Bibles, having devotions and prayer, that's exactly Satan's plan. That's exactly Satan's plan. Why? Because he knows that when the harder times come, you won't be able to stand. Because we were, we were told right there, as it says in the very beginning, only those who have been diligent students of Scripture and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusions. From the powerful delusions. You know, Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Of my heart. You know, when you study the Bible, here, you know, here Jeremiah compares it to eating. I ate your words, and what he, he say, they were a joy and rejoicing to my heart. You know when food is the best? 
when it is taking time to prepare it. You know, no matter how many times they may advertise it as good, microwave food will never be as good as slowly cooked homemade food. It will never be. Even, you know, they advertise it just like mom or just how home cooking. It will never be the same. As you cutting up the tomatoes, the cilantro, whatever it is, cooking it in the pot, waiting, and, and then cooking it at the right speed. You know, you can, you can ruin the taste by cooking it on a high real quick. And just taking the time and savoring the food. So if, if Jeremiah compares it to food, how should we study the Bible? Like microwave food? I hope not. We take time in studying the Bible. So I'd like to just ask, why study the Bible? What's the big deal? I gave you right now an important reason. Your salvation depends on it. Your salvation depends on studying the Bible. There are great controversy, page 600. Temptations often appears irresistible because through neglect of prayer and the study of the Bible, the tempted one cannot readily remember God's promises and meet Satan with the scripture weapons. Not just for your salvation, but even for temptations. Even for temptations. Knowing just the Bible truth and doctrine isn't enough so you to stand in temptation. You need a daily study, a daily study of, tempta of, of the Word of God. Of the Word of God. But angels, but angels are round about those who are willing to be taught in divine things. And in the time of great necessity, they will bring to their remembrance the very truth which are needed. Which are needed. So why study the Bible? Well, because our salvation depends on it, but because it helps us to deal with temptation. To deal with temptation. The classic example that we all know, Jesus in the wilderness, he dealt with temptations with Scripture. With Scripture. So there in 2 Timothy 2, where we are, verse 14 and 15, where we just read, Verse 14 says, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. And then our scripture verse, Be diligent to present yourself, approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Something else that, that benefits of why studying the Bible is that you won't be ashamed. Here, it's right here in the verse. A, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. I can give you several examples where I had lacked the study of the Word of God and somebody came to me with a Bible question and I couldn't answer it because I didn't study and I was ashamed. I was ashamed. So here, the, the Word of God helps us to be ready for when Jesus comes, it helps us to fight temptation and it helps us not to be ashamed. Not to be ashamed, to, to, to be able to answer the questions that may be brought out. That may be brought out. And notice how the Bible there says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Then that means that there can be a wrong way to divide the word of truth. A wrong way. To give an interpretation or to give a conclusion. There can be a wrong way. If you rightly do divide the word, you will not be ashamed. If you wrongly divide it, you will be. You will be. So I like to begin by, before talking about the methods of Bible study, is the preparation of Bible study. The preparation of Bible study. If you join with me there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There is some preparation. Just how when you cook food, you have to first prepare it before you begin to even heat the pot. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
verse 10. It says, But God has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things yes and deep things are and yes the deep things of god for what may for what man knows the things of a man except the spirits of the man which is in him even so no one knows the things of god except the spirit of god so the holy spirit is the one that knows verse 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from god that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by god so how is it that we know about god is given to us by who by the spirit by the holy spirit verse 13 these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches but which the holy spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of god for they are foolish to him nor can he know them because they are sp spiritually discerned part of the preparation work is to ask the holy spirit to guide you in your study ask the holy spirit to give you wisdom to give you wisdom there in James turn with me to to the book of James right after right after Hebrews James chapter 4 verse 3 we need to be in sync in tune with the Holy Spirit so you when you begin in opening your Bible you ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit James 4 verse 3 you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasure you see sometimes we ask for our own selfish reasons or we are we are having our Bible studies for our own selfish reasons and we do not come to God with an open heart we may come to the study of the Bible and say, now I know that verse is in here somewhere because you want to fulfill your agenda. Because maybe you want to continue doing what you're doing and maybe someone says, you know, God doesn't want us to do that or God doesn't want us to walk in that direction and you're thinking, well, there is a verse somewhere and you begin to study it but not asking the Holy Spirit to help you but with your own agenda. What does the word amiss mean there in verse 3? You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. Does somebody else have a different word? You ask wrongly. You ask for the wrong thing. You ask for the wrong thing. Sometimes we, we do that when we come to the word of God. We need to make sure that we come with an open heart. With an open heart. And telling God, Lord, teach me what you want me to learn there from education page 189 the student of the Bible should be taught to approach it in the spirit of a learner that's the most important thing the spirit of a learner that that means you're there to learn we are to search its pages not for proof to sustain our opinions but in order to know what God says friends amen when, when we come to the Bible, when you go to your desk, when you go to your chair, and you're going to study the Bible, you need to take away your preconceived ideas. You need to take away the idea, well, you know, I know that's in there somewhere. So I'm going to look for it until I find it. Continuing here from Messages to Young People, page 261, and this is also found in Testimonies to Ministers, page 107. The spirit in which you come to the investigation of the scriptures will determine the character of the assistance at your side. Now we're talking serious. Okay? The spirit in which you come. What attitude do you come when you open the Bible? We're talking about pre with preparation. The spirit in which you come to the investigation of the scriptures will determine the character of the assistance at your side. Angels from the world of light will be with those who in humility of heart seek 
for divine guidance. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You come to your desk, you come to your chair, and you, can ask, and you pray, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to be in the attitude of a learner. And if there is something that goes against what my idea is, please reveal it to me. Now, there we are told that our attitude depends. The spirit in which you come, who is going to assist at your side? Of course, if we come with, with a humble spirit, the angels will be there. And if we don't come with a humble spirit, obviously, who will, who will be there? It continues saying, but if the Bible is open with irreverence, with a feeling of self-sufficiency, okay? You're not going with an open mind and you're opening it irreverently. Maybe you're watching TV and you're, and you're trying and you're studying your Bible at the same time. If the heart is filled with prejudice, Satan is right next to you. And he will set the plain statements of God's words in a perverted light. How much is preparation for Bible study important? Very important. What is your attitude when you come to the Bible? When you sit down? Are you thinking, well, I know the brother told me, or I know the pastor preached about this, but, but you know, I read here somewhere that, that you know, David, he did some dancing, and I know that's in there. And, uh, you know, I read here that, that, that Noah drank some wine. What is the attitude that you come to the Bible? Are you coming to it? You know, so many times I hear it. Well, I read in the Bible, Jesus ate meat. And the agenda is, I have an excuse. <laughs> what is the attitude in which you come? Is it for your own agenda? To fulfill, to continue fulfilling what you want to do? If that's the case, friends, right here is who's next to you. Spoken by the testimony of Jesus. Far be it, friends, that Satan or his angels are next to us, perverting the light. Perverting the light. Far be it, friends. The attitude which we come determines who is going to stand next to you. And I want the Holy Spirit and his angels standing next to me. How about you? Amen. Amen. The hard work is so important. This is just the preparation. We haven't gone to the method yet. The preparation. Coming to God. John 7, 17. Open your Bible there at John 7, 17. We're still talking about preparation. John 7, 17. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether it or whether I speak on my own authority you want to know what the Bible has to say there if anyone wills to do his will are you willing to do whatever God says that's a hard that's that's a, a question we really have to pause Whatever God says. If that is what God is looking for, so you can be taught of Him. So you can be taught of Him. Those that come with an open heart, God can pour out and teach you what He wants you to learn. Amen. What He wants you to learn. If anyone wills to do His will, he shall know concerning the doctrines. God is telling us, you will learn, but you got to be able to do whatever I say and have an open heart, an open heart. You know, we, we like, we like what, what there we read earlier in Timothy that all is, of Scripture is inspired by God, right? We like that. But we don't like where it says that it's good for reproof and correction, <laughs> So we have to be willing to come with an open heart. John 5, we're there in the book of John. Turn with me to John chapter 5, verse 39. 
We need to look for Jesus in every Bible study that we have. Amen. For Jesus and the plan of salvation. John 5, 39. There, Jesus says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Amen. They testify of Jesus. You remember the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus with Jesus? At the end, Jesus opened the scriptures and revealed himself from the prophets and onward. He showed them about the Messiah, about Jesus in all the scriptures. When we come to a Bible study, we need to be looking for something. Our, 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 our spiritual antennas have to be looking for something. Not for, our, not for our agenda, no, but for Jesus in every part. When we study the Bible, look for Jesus. And sometimes you will have to study a passage over and over and over because you may not see Jesus in that passage. Does that, does that mean he's not there? It means we haven't looked deeper into it. We need to look deeper. Jesus is in every passage, in every part of the Bible. John 20, John 20, verse 30. The last chapter in John, John tells us why he wrote his gospel. There, John 20, verse 30 and 31. And this is one thing that I would like to ask John when I get to heaven. Or I can ask Jesus, Jesus himself. But he says here, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in the book. And when I, when I read that, my, I stopped before going to verse 31. And I was like, that's not fair. <laughs> John saw extra things. But he didn't put them here. He didn't put them here. And my mind sometimes just goes and wonders, man, I wonder what else he did. I wonder if he did this. I wonder if he did that. But he tells us here in verse 31, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John tells us, I wrote the gospel so you can see Jesus in everything and so you can believe it and you may have eternal life in his name. You may have eternal life in his name. Steps to Christ, page 90. One passage studied until its significance is clear to the mind and its relation to the plan of salvation. There it is. So to the plan of salvation is evident, is of more value than the, than the perusal of many chapters with no definite purpose in vain and no positive instruction gained. If sometimes you read a passage and you don't understand it, well, let's keep reading. She'd say, no, no, just stop. Until what is, until what is clear? The, it's, it's relation to the plan of salvation. Until you see Jesus in the passage. Continue studying that same passage. Continue studying the Bible. Don't just brush it off. So, what are some methods of, Bible, of studying the Bible? There are several methods, and we're going to get to the most beneficial. One method could be a word study, where you take a word, and you want to know what the Bible has to say about that specific word. An example is Revelation 10, verse 7, where it says, the mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? You can take that word and study where else it's used. So you can, have, you can study your Bible in a word method, in specific words, in what they mean and how they apply to, to the writer and how they apply to you. You can study by subjects or by, or by themes. You want to know about heaven. What does the Bible have to say about heaven? What does the Bible have to say about ghosts? The Bible has to say about every single subject, friends. You can study by books. You can read a specific book over and over and over. What does that book have to say to me? Like say, for, a, for, for instance, the book of Deuteronomy. If you read the book of Deuteronomy over and over, you'll notice that Moses is writing his last letter to his people before he dies. 
And he is repeating a lot that he has already mentioned earlier. It's kind of his farewell letter. The Ten Commandments are also repeated in, Deut in Deuteronomy. And he's letting them know to remember God. It, 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 it's, it's his farewell letter. Some things that I would suggest and highly recommend is to invest in Bible study. How many of us have a, a hobby? How many of us spend, wow, really? The rest of you just don't do anything else? <laughs> How many of you spend money on your hobby? Yeah, it's okay. It's not a sin to spend money on your hobby. <laughs> you know, whatever your hobby is, you may, you know, you may spend money, whether it's a sport, whether it's an activity, whether it's fishing, whether it's an, an playing an instrument, uh, whatever it may be, you spend money in whatever hobby it is. You invest in that hobby, right? You invest in the equipment, whatever the equipment may be. Maybe it may be a new bow for archery, a new club for swinging, whatever the instrument may be, you invest in it. And you invest time in your hobby. Invest in Bible study, friends. Not just time in equipment as well. Get a good Bible. Get a good Bible. You know, a Bible that is binding won't break when you read it daily. <laughs> a sewn binding is, is perfect. They're going to be more costly, but you're investing. It's an, it's an investment. It's not just a book you bring once a week and then that's it. No, it's an investment that you use every day. Invest time and your monies in Bible studies. Invest in tools. Invest in your tools. You know, there are computer software that help you in Bible studies. There are some free softwares that I can just re recommend for those that are PC users. eSword. eSword is a free software for good Bible study. And it's, it's, and it's free. You want to invest money, you can, you can buy Logos, which is a good software for Bible study as well. I won't go into all the details of, of all that it comes with, but it comes with many tools. Invest that. Quick Verse is another one. If you're a Macintosh user, a Mac, amen, eSword X, e -Sword X is, is a good tool as well that you can use. Accordance is one that you can buy and install and it helps you in your Bible studies as well. Get a good concordance. If you cannot, if you, if you cannot purchase the entire SCA Bible commentary, you can check them out here at the library. I'm putting a little plug in. You can, we have them here at the library. But if you want to have one always at your house, buy for sure volume 8. Volume 8 of the SEA Bible Commentaries. That's the Bible Dictionary. The Bible Dictionary. Out of all the SEA Bible Commentaries, the Dictionary, Volume 8, is the one that I use the most. The Dictionary. It's, it's, it's a good Bible Dictionary. And as you are about to have your own personal study time, friends, make sure that you're clear from any distractions. You, you have to be clear from any distractions. That means you have to be clear from any, from your cell phone. If you're using your computer, take away, turn off your email, disconnect it from the internet if you need to. Um, take away any distractions that may distract you from Bible study. And that may mean also locking yourself in a room. And telling your children or telling your spouse, I need, to, I need an hour, I need 30 minutes, I need blank time, I am not here. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I've, I've told my wife, you know, during this time, I am not here. And then my kids may say, but what if it's an emergency? Your mom will take care of it. Your mom knows how to drive, she knows where the hospital is, but right now, I am busy. And friends, that may be the case. Satan will want to interrupt your time. He may interrupt with someone coming and knocking. Papi, you know, can you help me? A phone call for you. There's someone at the door. Somebody is calling for you. They say it's an emergency. 
It may be an emergency. But have somebody else take care of it while you are in your personal time with God. Your personal time with God. Clear from any dis distractions. And that means even in your desk. You know, if you have bills there, put them where you can't see them. If you have maybe some things, you know, a, a picture, or maybe you may have a, a screen that changes pictures that may, oh, you know, and you start remembering something else. No, get rid of it. I mean, just for then, not get rid of it. But for that amount of time that you have separated with God, put away any distractions, friends. Put away any distractions. So you, would you like to know, I gave you some, some methods of word studies, subjects, or books, but the most beneficial way of studying the Bible, the most beneficial way, we find here in education page 189, the daily study, the, no, in daily study, the what? Verse by verse method is the most helpful. Now the other methods are helpful, of course, but the most helpful, are the verse by verse. Let the student take one verse and concentrate the mind on, on, on ascertaining the thought that God has put into that verse for him and then dwell upon the thoughts until it becomes his own. That means you can spend a whole 30 minutes or an hour just on one verse. You will benefit more of that than just speed reading the whole chapter and not getting anything. One passage thus studied until its significance is clear is of more value than the perusal of many chapters with no definite purpose in view and no positive instruction gained. The verse by verse method. So I thought, let's, let's do that right now. Let's have a verse by verse little example study right now. Turn to, turn to Mark, the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, and we're going to just, we're going we're to apply this right now, the verse by verse method. You know, when you read the history of the SEA church, William Miller studied his Bible verse by verse, and he would not go to the next verse until he understood the verse where he was at. Re read the history of our pioneers. And William Miller, he studied, he read the Bible several times from cover to cover, but he did not advance until he understood that passage. Verse by verse. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Verse 40. Here, the story of Jesus cleansing a leper. Okay, so it says there, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. So let's, 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 let's try this. How did Jesus heal this leper? How? Did he, how? He, touched he touched him. Good. That's the wrong answer, but good. <laughs> I was hoping you would say that. Now let's apply the verse by verse method, okay? Let's take verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Stop. That's one verse, right? What is in that one verse? What did the leper do? He knelt. He asked. It's important that when you study the verse by verse, you ask questions that only the verse can answer. Okay, don't ask other questions that you got to look at. Only questions that the verse can answer. Okay, so what did the leper do? Well, he knelt down. He asked. He had faith. He sought out Jesus. How many of us, applying that one verse, are like this leper? We seek out Jesus. We kneel down and pleading to Jesus. And we ask for Jesus, if thou will. 
That's why when we pray, Jesus says to pray, if thy will be done, let your will be done. And here the leper is saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You can make me clean. Now, when did the leprosy leave him? Verse 41. Then Jesus moved with compassion and stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Is he cleansed yet? Verse 42. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy, what? Left him and he was clean. So when did the leprosy leave him? When he spoke spoke right when he spoke friends there is power when God speaks when he made this world he spoke it into existence there is power in his voice didn't he tell Lazarus Lazarus come forth and he came forth there is power in his voice so then the question why did Jesus touch him why is, that in, in the, in, why, why is that in verse 41? Because he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. You see, when he was still a leper, he touched him. He didn't heal him. Be cleansed. Okay, now I can touch you. He touched him being a leper. Friends, you can create a whole sermon just in that one verse. Jesus still touches the sick sinners with compassion. Jesus had compassion. See, leprosy, you wouldn't even come near a leper. They were far away, much less touch them. Jesus here is showing them the heart of God that comes down to the sickest disease that was known that day and touches him skin to skin. And showing compassion. Showing compassion on him. When you are filthy sick of sin, Jesus has compassion and touches you and me. Jesus is showing him the heart of God. He healed him. But he healed first his soul. And then he healed his body. There's so much that we can take from this verse. Now how can we apply it? We should be compassionate with others. We should have compassion as Jesus did as well. Does anyone remember what I preached, those who were here last Sabbath? What, what, the, what the sermon was about? About time? Based on Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. Although I didn't go into much of the details of the ram and the goat, the whole sermon was based on Daniel 8.1 and Daniel 9.1. You see, you, re you remember there in Daniel 8.1, he gets the vision in the years of Belshazzar. But then in Daniel 9.1, he gets the interpretation in the first year of Darius. It took me a long time to catch that. After reading it over and over and over, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He was in Belshazzar. And he gets the interpretation in Darius. Well, how much time did that pass? And that led, to, that led to other stings. And that led to the sermon of last Sabbath. That God uses time as an appeal. That God uses time to transform our hearts. That God uses time to mold us. To mold us. Verse by verse is the most beneficial method, friends. The most beneficial method. There are five safeguards I'd like to share with you. One, open the Bible with prayer and self-distrust. We saw that already. When you come to the Bible, open it with prayer and self-distrust. Not trusting in your own thoughts or your own ideas or what your parents might have told you or your grandparents or your never. No. Come to the Bible with an open mind and let the Holy Spirit teach you. Number two, use, use different types of Bible translations. It's, it's good to see how other translators translated the verses. I would stay away from paraphrases when it comes to Bible study. Pra paraphrases are good for light, leisure reading. But when, it, when you come to want to read the Bible, you see, a paraphrase is somebody else's thoughts put into a book. I don't want somebody else's thoughts. I want God's thoughts. 
and the Holy Spirit. And so use other translations and, and if you're bilingual, other languages to see what, how the in, interpreters in, translated those passages as well. Begin with easy passages first, then move to harder passages. Begin with easy passages. If you're gonna study the state of the dead, and this is your first time maybe, I wouldn't begin with the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. That one's a little bit harder. Study with the easier passages where Ecclesiastes says that the dead know nothing. Where Psalm says that the dead do not praise the Lord. Where John 11 says that Jesus compares death as the sleep. Those, those are easier passages. And then you move on into the harder passages. You move on to the harder passages. Compare your conclusion with the rest of the Bible. Amen and amen. You have to compare your conclusion of your verse by verse or your chapter with other parts of the Bible because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. The Bible does not contradict itself. And of course, use, use properly the spirit of prophecy. Use properly the spirit of prophecy. So one of my closing texts for this morning is Isaiah 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28, verse 9. Who will he teach knowledge? Here he's asking, who will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? You want to know who it is? Those just weaned from milk. Those just drawn from the breasts. What is Isaiah saying here? See, how... How does a baby feed itself? How, who does a baby depend on to feed itself? The mother. The mother. But there comes a time where the baby grows and it better not still be feeding on the mother. <laughs> there comes a time where the baby has to feed itself. The child feeds itself. After church today, after this service, we have fellowship lunch. What if I were to say, you know, Hannah, I'll pick on you. Hannah, you can't have lunch. You cannot have lunch at all. Okay? You can't have the desserts. What would Hannah do? Fine, I go home and I what? I feed myself. I feed myself. Here Isaiah is saying, who will be taught? Who can be taught? Who can understand? Those just weaned from the milk. Those just drawn you have to feed yourself, friends. See, it's one thing that you learn from your pastor, but it's another thing that you are dependent on your pastor. I'm not against learning from other people. I learn a lot from other people and from other pastors, but I am not dependent on others for my learning. See, the baby is dependent. If the baby didn't get fed, the baby would die. The baby doesn't know how to feed itself yet. And so we have to feed ourselves. If this morning is the only time you get fed, friends, you are in serious trouble. Because you are depending on whoever is speaking behind the pulpit. And here Isaiah says, those who are weaned from the milk, weaned from the breast, it means you're not dependent on somebody else. You feed yourself. You feed yourself. You, you, we have to learn to feed ourselves. And that's why in verse 10, we know this verse, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We use the whole Bible in studying the scriptures of God. So in conclusion, friends, why again is this even relevant or important? Just, I'm going to just read again the meditation there of Great Controversy 625. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the word captive. The world captive. By the 
Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise, friends. I want to be able to detect the deceiver. I want to be ready for when he comes. And the only way to be ready, friends, is to study the Bible. And I'm, I've given you some tools of studying the Bible. Take time to study the Bible. You take time to enjoy your hobby, good. But do not neglect. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Jesus, Jesus says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So I appeal to you, church, to study the word of God. Yes. Study the word of God. I want to be ready for when he comes. Do you want to be? Yes. The only way is to be rooted and grounded in his word. That is the only way we can be ready. Now how many, how many need to spend serious time in Bible study? All of us, friends. As, as my wife sings this song, this, 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 this is going to be our closing song, and it's an appeal. It's a, it's a closing song and an appeal. We will have the, bene the benediction after the song. I want you to listen to the words. It's a, it's a message in a question if you are ready for when Jesus comes. The only way to be ready is to study the Word of God. We've seen here that the devil will do anything to keep you out of this book. He will keep you busy. He will keep you distracted. And we've also seen that the only way to be ready is to be in the Bible. To study it. And I really encourage the verse by verse by verse method. The verse by verse by verse method.